introduction of GSAP structures and planning series for the spring semester. Today we have the pleasure to listen to Miguel Valdra, um, Associate Professor of Urbanism at the Parsons School of Design in the New School. Professor Valdra is also co-founder of Cohabitation Strategies, an international nonprofit cooperative for social spatial research and developmental practice um, based in Rotterdam and New York City which focuses on conditions of urban decline, inequality, and segregation within the contemporary city. Parallel to his works at cohabitation strategies, Professor Robert Durand's main research is centered on the strategic definition and coordination of transdisciplinary urban projects, as well as on the developmental of tactical design strategies and strict engagement platforms that confront the contradictions of neoliberal organizations such as homelessness, housing prices, gentrification, the effects of financialization on the real estate industry, inter-urban competition, and urban social movements. So in today's talk, Professor Albus Duran will share with us some of these concrete projects that he's been involved in and help us think about what it means to have a radical urban practice for today. And please join me in welcoming this speaker. Uh, 
who's been quite elementally contributing to uh, the organization. Now, um, the talk today was about uh, figuring out or discussing certain contributions that appear under our intent of this practice or these projects through seven projects. I put here 10 years ago, um, the reason that we existed or that we managed to come together is that I was exhibiting a project at the Venice Biennale in 2008. Uh, Emiliano was a curator together with Aaron Desky uh, of the Biennale in general, so Emiliano was, was taking care of the Italian pavilion at that time. And, um, and we somehow met at that point uh, of that intersection where we couldn't, um, uh, we couldn't figure out or most of were appalled by what we were seeing, this is in 2008, at the main exhibitions, which basically were what we call, and sorry if I, I will use some languages that might offend people, but really sorry, what we call somehow the sign masturbations uh, of, um, uh, of like, extreme excess, of extreme luxury, uh, of extreme cost, um, and that only exemplified in these exhibitions the use of what the, the millionaires and billionaires that were becoming wanted out of the sign. <coughs> and how the industry in general was so condescendent uh, into this. I mean, we're talking about 2008 here, right? Which it was still not enraged uh, as it was today against a lot of these designers. And obviously I'm talking that since we started even before this, we've always pushed ourselves very much against the criticism of the superstar regime. Uh, I had the pleasure and not pleasure of working uh, as a professor in uh, the University of Delft, uh, and, uh, well, there, and I was also in charge of a big unit at the Bellag Institute, at the time the Bellag Institute existed uh, as such, uh, in the Netherlands, as well as I was teaching in Switzerland. Um, and um, one of the things that I decided to do, because of a constant confrontation with all of these super, superstar regimes, was uh, to, it actually helped me build or start building a position that was very antagonistic to that. For example, at the Bellman Institute, we constantly had uh, people like Remy Colas, and I was teaching together, not together, but side to side in the different studio with people like Dean Mass and so forth at that time. I'm not sure I even, if today even matter to these people anymore, because I have been so distant from that discourse, thankfully. But at the time that we were developing the project of qualification strategies, we were not. They were the enemy for us. Right now, we really don't care about them. But at that time it was, and so it all started there at, at the Venice Finale when, when we said like, you know, this cannot continue anymore. How is it possible that 95% of the exhibition deals only with, um, with uh, yeah, demonstrations of wealth uh, and power, or basically representations of wealth and power, and how this establishment is just going purely into, you know, uh, all of this. And so uh, as we were talking about this, suddenly we received a notification. Um, uh, I did receive a notification from a friend, uh, which has become uh, my greatest mentor and one of my biggest collaborators, which is an urban theorist, his name is David Harvey, um, and, uh, and David Harvey sends me a, a text uh, saying, uh, Miguel, did you see the news? I mean, Lehman Brothers just collapsed. And then, uh, you know, we look at Lehman Brothers, and then, uh, yes, everything was collapsed. And so for us, it was one of those, like, um, incredible moments, right? Right in the middle of the Giardino, in the, in the Venice right? Uh, seeing all this profusion exhibition of luxury items, luxury goods, and so forth, at the same time understanding that uh, that this crisis had been created pretty much by urbanization, I mean, as we understand it as such. And so uh, this is how we uh, began. At the moment, we have um, uh, developed 16 projects as an entity of coalition strategies. We are finishing with one project right now in Calgary, um, in which might be our last project of this kind, right? Uh, I'm quite sure, right? And, uh, and uh, within this, um, let's say, I'm going to try to explain very, very fast because I know I have a limited time. Uh, as I mentioned, I mean, one of our biggest inspirations this is an image that has made my presentations always since I started giving lectures around, um, which is uh, an uh, image that I took at an uh, Amsterdam airport skip over when I was living there. Um, and uh, and an, ad, an ad of the Financial Times. Strangely enough, I think the Financial Times is the best newspaper today uh, for many reasons. I mean, I'm not giving a, a promotion to it, but it's uh, the most serious newspaper that capitalists like to look like and expect. And so I think the other newspapers have done too much into ideological issues. These guys really know what they want. They want to advise capitalists and they do it the way they do. But it's incredibly expensive. Um, so I'm not subscribed to it. I get the news from other people. This it really is super expensive newspaper. Anyway, but uh, as I'm strolling to, to the airport, I find this 
I, I think at that time, remember 2008, this was like for me like the absolute almost representation of what was happening to cities you know, um, in general. And I think it's very close to what's happening now. Uh, not, not, not long ago, I went to give a tour to a friend that visited uh, of Hudson Yards and you know and all of these things, and we can still see those modes of representation as we uh, come here. But this had the incredible and uncanny ability of representing all of that as an island, you know, as its own sort of like unit. And uh, and together, of course, the major representation, even though we're talking about financial times of world business, it was obviously architecture, right? And architecture and the planning that comes out of architecture that represented this. Until today, I have not found a better image that represents this. And uh, I'm working on another book, and this will be the cover, hopefully, because I'm trying to convince the, author, the authors to do so. Um, but uh, with, with that uh, in, in kind, so the, this was for, for us like our contingent, you know, the, the, the thing that we were uh, pushing ourselves against. Um, and um, we decided that we would start an organization that would do something quite different than that. First of all, it was a hard thing to do, which was the rejection of the built form. Um, and that is one of the issues that has always made us very unpopular or controversial or no one gives a damn about us in architecture schools or in urban planning schools that stem from architecture uh, or urban design school, which is clearly stemming from architecture too, which is that we don't believe that any form of built, for, uh, built form, I mean the materiality of things, is anything, um, uh, will give anything substantial to the reconstruction of a new world that, or the construction of a world that we want to see, which is not the world that we are now. On the contrary, we believe that the production of materiality, of form, of buildings, of, uh, of, of concrete designs, contributes to, uh, to exacerbate the differences at the moment of where we are. So it's, a, it's basically a historical, uh, very historicized concept, right? Uh, in other moments, for example, during the welfare state in the 50s and 60s, we have written some articles which we claim that, that building was actually incredibly relevant for the construction of better well-being of humanities. But right now, we actually think it's not. And so, with that in mind, uh, the practice was constructed on the following points that I'm going to show you. One of them was, um, we were interested in figuring out how we could design uh, systems, uh, operate at levels of uh, economy and so forth, and working with anti-speculative development proposals. What does, this, what does this mean? It's basically, uh, let's say you look at the realm of housing, um, well, you basically kind of make profit out of it, right? And, and how is that possible? What exists? What mechanism exists? What kind of mechanism exists worldwide that actually allow that kind of speculative uh, forms of development? And how can we promote it and support organizations in the development of such things? Um, uh, together with that, of course, uh, is the creation of alternative property models. Uh, these uh, have been quite popularized in the last uh, four or five years, although we've been working on them for some time, which were not as popular as they're now, such as in New York, uh, specifically community land trust and that type of stuff, collectives, cooperatives, housing co-ops, um, uh, living connectivity co-ops, and so forth. Um, we also believe that many of those models are not translatable to today. They're very old. And I always put the example of something like a community land trust, the only reference we have is the Cooper Square Community Land Trust, which has been going on since the 70s, and tons, I mean, not hundreds, but certainly dozens of organizations have tried to replicate such a thing, and they have not been successful. So clearly, you know, it's not translatable. Nevertheless, we put a lot of resources in trying to replicate systems that are not feasible to replicate today. Um, and, but I will discuss perhaps some community land trusts later. Another very important thing that uh, we decided to work on is on the politics of scale. Uh, a bit controversial from an architectural, for an architecture school or uh, also a planning school is that we believe that the city matters less and less. Uh, we don't think that the power and the might of, of the city uh, is, uh, of urbanization is the city, sorry. So the power of urbanization is not the city. And for us to comprehend that and to theorize that and to exemplify that, we have to work at politics of scale, which means we have to look at regional uh, governments, we have to look at national governments, and a big interest of mine over the last years has been looking at supranational organizations and governments that drive urbanization, right? So for us, urbanization, and let me put it as clear as I can, is the absolute representation of capitalism in space, right? The city is capitalism represented in space, right? That is, for us, the pure view. And therefore, our main 
point of interest was not per se the city, but how capitalism is represented in space. And for that, the representation of space is the city. Right? So the fetish or the fetishization of the city, of the skylines, and so on, uh, cease to be you know, the common fetish that we normally have when we study architecture and so on. Um, and, and that would be very important for us. Um, the common collective uh, uh, um, shared infrastructure, every time more and more, we're a bit more suspicious of that. But already in 2008, we were talking about the commons and all that type of stuff that everybody likes to talk more and more and more on it. And we have tried to practice on this and, of course, uh, found out a lot of contradictions that come into these collectives, shared infrastructures, communities, community development, and so forth. Um, uh, development of urban unions, I might actually go uh, in the next, in the first project, one percent. Uh, a little bit on that, but that's a concept that we have been developing. Hopefully, we'll like to we'll be presenting this in an exhibition very soon. The whole concept of the review, which is basically uh, we use a metaphor of what would be a labor union uh, and trying to translate it. What could it be that citizens take over the production of their space and so on to some kind of organizational formation uh, against the forces of capitalism? Uh, economies of use value, um, which is the sixth point. Um, uh, I. Uh, I am trained uh, as a Marxist thinker, um, and uh, as I said, my, my main mentor has been David Harvey, and uh, well, he's one of the primary Marxist thinkers uh, in the world. And so, the the the, but I totally, you know, dig it. I mean, like I, I completely follow, and we have to discuss, we discuss this a lot. Um, and um, and therefore, for me, the distinction between what is uh, two basic Marxist concepts, which is called exchange value and use value which are uh, ways that he determines what a commodity is. Um, uh, exchange meaning what you get in exchange out of that, and use value what you get to use. And again, I do always like to use the concept of housing for uh, audience to understand what that means. A housing, you use it for leading, which is what it should be for, or you use it for speculating, which is what it's been used now more. So the greater majority of the buildings that are built now in New York City are built for speculation, not for the use. So one of the questions was uh, how to uh, also push the ideas of economics of use value, you know, to emphasize the use rather than the exchange uh, condition. Um, the space for political implementation, I think that speaks by itself. And then radical representation strategies, which is my fantasy, which I like to draw a lot. And um, this is one of the few things that remain from education as a designer. And uh, an artist, sometimes I play the role of that. Um, and, uh, and we like to, to really play with representations, and you'll see that a lot in this. So um, I'm not sure if I'm actually going to achieve this. I'm already uh, anyway, in time. I mean, I'm going to time this. Okay, so our first uh, um, basis was to construct the theoretical um, uh, body that sustained the practice. And um, a lot of people helped produce these. Uh, at that time that we were doing these, we had a whole consortium of friends from feminist, uh, right of feminist, uh, from um, Marxist thinkers, from philosophers, and so on. We were trying to figure out lawyers and so on. Um, uh, the, the forms of research that we wanted to uh, structure uh, in the base of these. And what we did, we call these based a lot on the actual research uh, that you've been, that is told a lot to me, we call the interaction research, also influences by concepts of the Fed. I'm the FF, uh, which uh, it's one of the other uh, you know, people that influenced us. I think I have to uh, point out here that this is a 10 year uh, constant iteration of a theoretical position of what we think should be the methods in which urbanization should be studied today. And, um, and our main inspiration side would hear this, which is very important. It's the international such as Dadaist have influenced a lot of work, situationist internationals, certain parts of the Russian avant garde. Uh, as well as reference to 1960 <coughs> thinkers of France Fanon, um, uh, radical feminisms like Sigurd Ferenczi. We, we also uh, consider her one of our mentors. We work also with her uh, closely. And uh, in the 1970s, uh, of course, the Latin American uprisings uh, and uh, the writings of Paul Freire and the pedagogy of the press. And a lot of things uh, uh, have also been grabbed by an amazing thinker, his name is Orlando Falsborda. Um, which, uh, in my point of view, is the main source if you guys want to know about participant reaction research, which is not something that is well uh, um, uh, understood here in the U.S. because participant reaction research in the U.S. comes from and stems from a very different space, right? The Latin American space is certainly much more rich on this. So this would be basically our constructs. And what I mentioned, rather than focusing on design of buildings. Uh, or urban infrastructure, our, our practice decided to intervene um, in the value of social mobilizations, 
uh, tenement movements of the 60s or the 70s, uh, Europe and, and, and the United States, um, and, and learn from basically all of that. We have been creating many iterations of our, our methodology, but just to give you an idea, we wanted to have a cons meta conception of what we thought the city was. If you see, this is, an, uh, this is part of our, one of the first projects we ever did. Um, we started to look at the city not into its surface appearance, which would be the thing on top, which is the plan view and so on, but all sort of the sort of processes that mix into it, which would be the, in this case, it was all about the spaces of urban inequalities, the policy, social housing, urban regeneration, and so on. And we build these crazy methodologies that I am not even have time to, to explain now. But I want to, uh, I'm showing this to, um, uh, to present to you the process of building the practice, right? uh, which took us some time and, and until now, but it's still that uh, as such. Uh, now, we've done many publications and, and also at the fringes, sometimes we're surprised that we get invited to, to present this stuff at, at, at different uh, fancy venues such as the MoMA and so forth, which were part of an exhibition because we don't think it corresponds to the ideological basis of you know, these organizations. Nevertheless, we like to take advantage of their possibility to show this work, you know, wherever it is. And so, uh, so we're presenting seven projects, I'm presenting seven projects, and uh, these projects are the following. Um, uh, the, I chose these seven projects out of the 16 because they deal with very specific issues. First project will deal with state displacement in the south of Rotterdam, um, uh, which was a super important thing for us. Urban art under French conservative governance, second project. The possibility of urban interventions in a Canadian private art foundation. Um, developing an urban campaign in a neo feudal city in southern Italy, um, uh, designing an alternative housing model for New York City in a record crisis um, and housing crisis, uh, restructuring the urban operations of a public arts agency in Philadelphia, which is the largest public art agency in the United States, um, and uh, supporting the development of a social cultural hub in migrant neighborhoods in Milan. Now, I like to put this as the basis of the project, right, to say the titles of the project, because each project dealt primarily with these issues. Now, as you can see, they're very limited. It's not like, you know, we're designing a revolution or any other sort of like, you know, greatest things. I mean, of course, we, we more and more time passes that we become more and more aware of the incredible limits that we have to actually do a new project. And, uh, and the luck that we have had also in getting financing necessary for developing these projects which is also one of the primary questions that we get asked, right? It's like, how the hell do you get money to do this, right? Um, and, uh, and to put it in perspective, the, almost every project here had a working team of more than 20 people, and almost every project lasted more than a year and a half, right? So they are very large research, uh, practice, community-based projects. They're not tiny, small, by any means. And though they require a lot of resources uh, to develop. Uh, the first one that I want to discuss on, and then this will be very fast, so I'm sorry, and then I can go into questions to, to, to pass it like this, uh, very fast. So, um, uh, I was living in Rotterdam at that time, as I said, I was teaching over there. And um, we were asked to do, for a Biennale or something like that, a project, which we took advantage and used this um, basis of the project to apply for state funds and city funds, which is, they have a, um, a specific fund that is called Stimulating Small for Chicago, which is uh, a nice amount of money, right, uh, that you could get for some kind of crazy projects that you want. At that time, uh, believe me, there was no anti-capitalist, anti-neoliberal display of anything in the Netherlands, on the opposite. Uh, everybody was still on the neoliberal honeymoon, right, like the European Union is like the thing and the best. I assume the Netherlands right now is a similar one because they're, they're taking all the exiles, corporate exiles from Brexit, but that's a totally different thing. But whatever the case it is, it was very difficult for us to write this proposal. We were asking for close to 400,000 euros, so that's not a cheap amount. I mean, that's not little money here. Um, but for some reason, we managed to get this, right? I mean, and, uh, and, uh, and so we used this Biennale as a propeller for it. It's something that we use a lot, the arts, exhibition spaces, and so on, because I think we just, we just work to propel it. Um, but uh, here we develop this idea, uh, which is the metaphor and tradition of labor unions, uh, which improve the areas political and social economic fiscal condition without displacement was the main condition. Um, now, the site that we were working at, if you had been in Rotterdam, which I don't know why would you be in Rotterdam, but if you would be in Rotterdam, you would see um, uh, at the moment that there is this island, literal island, 
or with projects of fancy architects, uh, of cultural achievements. Uh, and more. So it's, uh, you have uh, Renzo Piano, you have uh, Alvaro Sisa, Norman Foster, uh, Rem Collins recently finished a hotel tower, office tower there. Um, it's an island that's called Villemina Pier. And Villemina Pier um, uh, was not totally built when we started working there. <coughs> On the opposite, it was starting to be uh, built. And in order for that to be built, they needed to also provide housing for people that would be supported by that new development. And therefore, there was a massive plan of displacement every neighborhood around it. Right? And uh, for our, that project, we decided, OK, let's, let's, let's get together with Antiguan community. Uh, and certain uh, Muslim community was working there, but like colonial uh, subjects of the Netherlands, which uh, a few of them live uh, in there. We had, through other projects before, good relationships with uh, the Antillean community, especially Antillean women, uh, which had been displaced and some still live in there, and started to work with them to figure out how we can produce this urban union. Now, uh, the urban union, uh, let me see, where the hell, okay, uh, structure, and I, I really like this schema because it tells you a lot on how we uh, operated as an organization. So uh, on the top, you will see uh, the academic institutions that were somehow supporting the project. Um, these academic institutions were academic institutions where I was teaching, so it's kind of easy, right? And it was not complicated. I went to the people that they supported and I say, are you willing to put you know, student support and so on? They said, yes, fine, you know, we do it. Uh, and it's very interesting because if you manipulate things, you know, it's about human rights and about all of that, they basically almost everyone says yes. You know? So that's also a teaching of that. Um, and then we started to create a, a team uh, composed of two very different units of, of research and action. We call one unit, or there's called the Strategic Research Unit, and then another one, which we'll see down, 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 further down, which is called Action Research Unit, or Action or something, I don't know if you remember. Um, and um, in the research unit, you had these people, you see my name there, uh, that were taking care of researching these specific issues of working with the community and from a very serious research perspective, education models, uh, democratic participation, urban theory, that was myself, and then governance and generation policy. We had a lawyer uh, working with us, which was Marcel Shukru, um, and uh, even a graphic designer uh, working with us to develop all the representations on that. Um, now, the issues that we addressed at this project were the prioritization of housing, the continuous displacement of Antia and Muslim communities, home at risk of demolition, redlining and urban isolation, engineering disinvestments, slum lords, the development of pressure of the neighborhood of urban generation project, the Rotterdam law. This was something that still exists, which is crazy. If you're Turkish and want to live in a Turkish neighborhood, you have to ask permission to live in there because they don't like concentrations of certain ethnicities. And uh, this is totally against any violation of any freedom right, but nevertheless, that happens. Um, and uh, created class politics, which was a big time in 2008. Richard Florida, you know that uh, idiot, you know, was uh, was uh, 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 the the main uh, sponsor of uh, not sponsor, he was an advisor of the mayor of Rotterdam at that time. Right? So, you know, all these things were very present. The governance of public-private partnerships happening like crazy uh, at that time. The privatization of the, in the Netherlands was just absolutely insane. They even they're more privatized than the U.S. Obviously. But just to give you an idea, even the mail is private, right? I mean, the post was privatized, just to put it there. And so, uh, and this happened, of course, nobody noticed, you know? It just happened because that was part of the European Union policies and so on, okay? And migrant labor and so on, which I don't have time. Another project that, um, that I want to show was uh, the issue of the Bordeaux Protocol, which is a project that started really weirdly, right? I mean, each of us have kind of like our own idols, let's say, in certain practices, and one person that I respected a lot in the art world was this, uh, the Arte Provera, which was an avant-garde, kind of pseudo, but kind of avant-garde movement of Italy in the 60s and 70s, and one of the main artists that uh, preceded this uh, was Michelangelo Pistoletto. Right? One day, we received a call from Michelangelo Pistoletto, and it was just like, what the hell is happening? This is you know, this, this one of these people that we think you're never going to meet in your life. Actually, I think you I thought he was dead, perhaps. Um, and um, Pistoletto calls us and invites us to help him produce an event that he was uh, called to be the director on, which was a big thing happening in the city of Bordeaux. But the weird part about this is that Michelangelo Pistoletto was hired by um, Alain Juppé. And Alain Juppé, if those of you that know him of French politics, he's one of the oldest establishment figures of the right of France. 
He's almost like a dictator of Bordeaux. He has been the mayor of Bordeaux. I think right now he's not there anymore, but we were there almost 30 years, right? And uh, he was, he had two ministerial positions under Sarkozy. He was the Minister of Interior and the Minister of, uh, of Foreign Affairs, I think, of Interior. Of, I don't remember which other ministry, but he's like a really high-end sort of personality. And so that person invites this radical left-leaning artist named Michelangelo Pistoletto to help them develop this huge project of interurban competition because they're trying, every city in Europe that, uh, still till today is competing against each other to see who can bring the better and the best and so forth. And so, um, and then Michelangelo Pistoletto invites this young sort of Marxist uh, to, uh, to basically help him produce this. So it's a very uh, weird sort of structure uh, on this. Anyway, uh, that happens and, um, and we saw it as an idea, it's just like, okay, uh, why don't we play into this game and see how much we can play into it? And uh, we took basically the challenge to see how far can we push this project until uh, a landscape breaks or someone in his um, the break. So our goal in this project, amongst many others, but one of the main goals was to see how far can we push the land And we, while well, Spain did that uh, as much as, as I can later today. Um, the project was organized in the following way. Um, so uh, Michelangelo Pistoletto needed uh, the methodology in which to develop this project, but also uh, asked us to help him find certain areas within the city where more social needs were you know, present or something like that. And so we started with a very uh, strong uh, mapping project um, where, uh, uh, well, we decided to focus on two uh, areas in the city. One of them was uh, Saint Michel. Those of you who have been in Bordeaux, Saint Michel is where you will find the most beautiful tower cathedral um, on Bordeaux. And uh, there's the plaza with a market. But the thing there is that the market and everything around this beautiful, absolutely beautiful site, um, it's just a Muslim population. Everything. It has been taken over by Muslim population. Now, in, in the side to that, you cross the street, and it was the, the hub of the creative class. So it was the downtown Bordeaux where the creative class was beginning to you know, come up all them white, all you know, Muslim, and they started to work in that specific area. And so part of the main plan of Alain Juppé was to use this event to, uh, uh, as an excuse to expel the Muslim population and in, their, in his work to take over back again to the French, to the French people, to be the French people, this beautiful original site of Saint Michel, right? And to this place. And you start to see the renders and the amount of architects, including very fancy architects that were working with this, uh, with this guy. Um, and the renders, of course, you know, that sushi bars, cafes, and you know, and the plazas and so on. And so we said, okay, that's a challenge, let's work there. And another area that we worked were the abandoned uh, sites of the Vance Ensembles, which is this big 1950s, 60s, 70s housing projects, mostly populated by old white French working class which are, have also been abandoned. And so within these two projects, um, uh, we uh, worked in the conditional housing, into the competition, um, and, and these were basically our main aim, generating knowledge that can be translated to certain artists, sort of blah, blah, and exposed general inner contradictions that have been uh, in Bordeaux. I also put here the main team, which is at the center, uh, and um, what we were working on, constitutional social relations, you know, mix of change of production, social and relay, life, blah, blah, blah. I'm not, I think it's just a lot of blah, blah, blah. For this project, we invited uh, also a bunch of friends that we had at that time, that we still have, some of them less than others, but yeah, we still, uh, like, you might recall a person named Damon Rich, um, uh, um, Damon, Teddy Cruz, I'm sure you've heard of them, uh, this artist, my pizza Potridge, and so forth. As so we invited a bunch of friends to collaborate, and this is Grand Park, this is the Grand San Samuel site. Uh, to develop a series of many projects guided by us, right, within that site. Now, the budget here was insane. It was uh, several millions of euros. So it was, we had like, insane budget. At the end, we didn't because we got kicked out. But that's a different uh, story. Now, um, a, there were many events that happened here. This was um, um, uh, the takeover of uh, uh, an abandoned market in San Michel. Um, we developed a lot of workshops. Uh, uh, but the main project, that we had, at least in San Michel and also in, in, in Grand Park, was to create another urban union. Right? Now, this has been, I think, the most successful urban unions that we have attempted ever to create. Uh, with the help of uh, Jeanne van Heesweig, uh, which again is this artist that I'm telling you about, and so on, um, uh, 
contacted uh, eight plus organiz Muslim organizations in San Michel and uh, managed to put them together. Organizations that had never actually worked together ever again. I mean, ever before, sorry. Um, and uh, put them together in one single room and began to show them what the municipality wanted to do with their environment, basically to clean them all. And then basically uh, mobilize them and telling them like, you guys are gonna end up like this, basically living somewhere else if you don't unite now and create a union and so forth. And so basically the project in itself was the creation of this union. Until today, that union exists and they have not been able to displace so much. They have done some damage, obviously, but not the, the, the type of damage that we're trying to create in terms of displacement. So the union still functions, and lovely enough, we have we receive not every year, yeah, every year more or less, notes from this organization saying that this is how we're doing, now, et etc., and so forth. Now there were many projects within this, and this was one of the main assemblies, for example, um, that uh, there was some much uh, the dudes term that were being developed. Again, this project was a year and a half uh, uh, in the making. Um, and uh, uh, this is how we were putting the calling posters uh, of uh, ideas, uh, and the, this was uh, the name of it, association. This was created for this project uh, for um, migrant uh, workers, the association for migrant workers, all of it referring to the urban uh, unions and so forth. And this is what put us the stuff for the project. So we're doing fantastically well, but pushing really the boundaries of this. And then uh, an organization, art organization from Russia, uh, their, their name, they go by the name of Stodelant, which is uh, a very radical group of <coughs> nice people. Uh, we invited them to uh, paint a mural in an area in Grand Park. And so they said fine, and they did this mural in a collective things where people, so what do you want to put in the big mural and so forth. And the mural uh, depicted Alain Juppé in the center as an octopus, you know, uh, devouring uh, all the things of Italy. Um, and this against the fraternité, liberté, qualité, you know, that, uh, that France did, uh, we were uh, asked to leave and the budget was, uh, you know, what I mean? and so we managed actually to push your pay to the limits, right? And, 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 and this still remains like that because it's in a private wall. So it's still there, right? It should be sun washed by now. But we couldn't finish the, 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 this, right? And, and that's how the project ended in, in, in general. But with a lot of successes, so, you know, that's, that's part of our kamikaze somehow modality. The issues that we've addressed here, uh, intention to run competition, concentrating investment for the creative class, powerful charismatic revenue major, major, sorry, and urban cleansing in the historic districts, etc. Um, now, uh, I'm gonna skip this one very fast because um, uh, I don't want to, I think I, I better uh, go to one that is further. This project what it was very important for us. It was the first project that we worked with participatory action of research influences from Hezbollah. And we're working with a Spanish uh, sociologist that was one of the main uh, ideologues together with Subcomandante Marcos in, in, in Chiapas with Zapatistas. Uh, they were very close and he helped produce a lot of the community arrangements of Oscar Polis in Mexico. And so uh, these Spanish sociologists started to work together with us and we developed a lot of things based on participatory actual research stuff uh, over here. Um, and uh, it was fantastic. So for some this, this, he's, he's the one, he's Angela, and, uh, and that was doing a sociogram, so makes examples of that. But uh, just to keep, put, put it here, the key issues that we addressed in this project were uh, suburbanization and sprawl, political cultural institutions, the cultural industrial complex, because we were hired by a foundation, a large foundation, that is owned by uh, the ex-owner of Blackberry. And he sold Blackberry before it went down. So it's a, a Canadian billionaire and has this foundation. And then this art foundation is supposed to do good. And then for some reason, the curator liked us and started to get in. Some crazy stuff happening. Um, the Campagna Urbana, it's again into that repetition of developing campaigns and projects that bring together people. Um, we mimic uh, the way that, uh, this is in the south of Italy, we, we mimic a lot of the urban campaigns that politicians do. Uh, this, these are our posters. We work a lot with graphic designers, and this is what I mean by representations. Um, and it started to plaster walls around the city with uh, something I call Campagna Urbana. And people start to confuse this, whether it was this a political campaign or not a political campaign, whether it was doing this because we're not by then presenting ourselves with this project. Um, uh, and then, um, I'm not going to go, so this is again uh, what we were trying to do, but it consisted on 
on these uh, um, projects here. Uh, this one involved a lot of writing and theater and some other communal actions because we're working with a cultural institution. Um, and uh, this is a, a few images, these are a few images of the different manifestations that we created. So at the end, this was the final image of the posters that were also on the round. We had collected works of serigraphy uh, with uh, different parts of the community um, and uh, different organized manifestations, local markets, local economies uh, function with trade, uh, a lot of uh, bartering stuff that we like to work with. Um, Etc. And then uh, uh, evening performances, uh, which was also fairly important for us. Uh, key issues here uh, a lot of political corruption, marginalization of working class neighborhoods, cultural peripheries, and extreme urban investment, especially in the south of Italy, is, is really the poverty levels are extreme. Um, cooperative housing for us, MoMA in New York City. I'm going to jump very uh, fastly. This was our proposal for what should housing be here in New York City. Uh, another crazy thing we saw in contact by the MoMA, they want to be part of this crazy exhibition, and it's like, MoMA, what should we not? Um, and then we decided yes, and we, with the specific terminologies, uh, ultimately building a um, uh, documentary that I would, if you're interested in this, I would probably recommend you look into it, which is uh, it's called New York, New York. It's a 24 minute documentary on the housing crisis in New York City with a lot of people. We survey a lot of stuff. And this was the most popular part of the whole exhibition. Uh, so uh, we're very happy, uh, of, of at least what we could do there. Um, and uh, which uh, goes against, again, the architecture establishment, the planning establishment, and so on. And then we also did uh, a series of animations. Space in the crisis caused by predatory speculation, politics, and policy. We researched a lot, the, we know a lot uh, of the housing situation here in New York, and so we use that knowledge to, to uh, uh, work with different groups, including the right to see alliance, and so on. So here, part, the first part of the, of the animation is explaining what is going on with you know, housing. Here we try to do it for a MoMA audience, which is basically, it. I think it might be too sophisticated even for a MoMA audience, but, but uh, because most people don't know and this is too complicated. Uh, but anyway, we explain this and then we build a proposal through it, you know, with this animation and so on, which is what's called corporate housing trust. Um, um, something happened with my monitor, that's fine. Okay, I can use this. And so this is another documentary, and, uh, and then a lot of the drawings that I told you about explain what the project is about. This is one of the very few projects that we have actually managed to, to try to show uh, special imaginary because MoMA was insisting you have to bring some architecture because an architecture, you know. And so this is as much architecture we, you know, want to do. We we can do because some of us are trained as that. But um, but uh, this was a, a co-housing sort of arrangement that we uh, you know, decided to, to work on. But but we I think this is the only one that we've done in since we started uh, the organization. Um, most of them are, are processes and okay, so issues, hyper speculation, financialization, grassroots. I still think is the main, the main enemy today. Right? I mean, uh, I mean the main enemy is capitalism by any means. But if we want to see capitalism represented in the city, is without doubt in the cities in housing. Right? I mean, housing represents almost everything. Some people are arguing that it's, it's right now passing the crisis into the re retail industry, and there are certain areas in New York City which you see is just empty, empty, empty. Right? But we can, you know, we have more time to talk about this. But uh, uh, playgrounds for useful knowledge. Was kind of, this was a project that started to kill us because it was too much energy. Uh, the largest uh, public arts organization in the United States hired us to create their new program, uh, a new program for the whole organization. And so we had to develop these together with pilots, right? Um, crazy, absolute crazy project. Um, and uh, what we did is similar to the influence of the Human Union we started to contact uh, uh, all of these constituencies. All of these are uh, uh, organizations were, that were in the neighborhood that we decided to operate in, uh, from Mexican communities, Asian American communities, Cambodians, Vietnamese, etc. And then uh, started to work on the different areas that each of these organizations work. And of course, you get a picture of the American non establishment, which is, um, they work only on that, right? I mean, it's like, 
you are non of health on that or food on that. And so part of the idea we, we worked on this project was how to create intersections between all of these organizations and so on. This is one of the main, was one of the main premises of this project. And then uh, these were the spaces of intersection that we're looking to create uh, here uh, in this space. Um, and uh, we did a number of, of actions. Um, and uh, we took over certain uh, vacant lands and so forth. Um, uh, let me show, for example, parts of it. Again, this, this goes with the idea of having fun. I'm not aware of it. Most. This, it was, this was like a classic example. Yeah, you have a price of burning. And they decide, I mean, we recommended a few people to continue working on different projects with them. Amongst them, Dan Rich is working or finishing, just finished one of these projects. And uh, ex students of mine, I also, young people, I just, and so they continue working with uh, the organization on the development of this project. But again, I don't have enough time. Uh, but oh, this one was beautiful. It's a food contest. That's why I got so fat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was one of the judges, that's me. And it was just like, yeah, anyway. And the whole point of the food contest, for example, was that you presented your plate, but you had to talk about your culture, where you came from, and everybody had to taste it, and so forth. So they're just elements that allows us to talk uh, on more radical issues with the community. Um, and, uh, blah, blah, blah. yes, I am on, oh, thank you very much. The last one, and I'm done with here, okay? Uh, Italy, um, I knew it was not gonna be possible. Um, Yes, yes, where to start here? I'm, I'm sure I should just let everybody. Another project that had to do with, um, with um, this investment in, in urban areas, high disinvestment, and the marginalization of Muslim communities. Um, and, uh, and this was again a cultural, urban kind of project, uh, which was a grant that we got from the European Union. And the way that we got this grant is that there was the uh, Expo, um, uh, World Expo happening in Milan at that time, and the European Union gave money for projects that somehow work with the World Expo. And they had a grant to work with sustainability projects. We, by no means, focus on sustainability, we think sustainability is just a capitalist, blah, 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 blah. But so we decided to draft a grant saying that we were super sustainable with cement and so on, and we got the grant, right? And so we started to use the grant uh, for uh, working uh, in the development of different kind of projects with the Muslim community specifically, but it ended up being a fantastic project of working with kids. Um, and we also did a talent show, it was called uh, Fucking with Talent and so on. The break continues until today, but um, the kids became the main drivers of these projects. Um, so we started to work with a school that was hyper-marginalized. Um, and um, uh, the reason we did this because uh, most of the adults living in this neighborhood they have absolutely no desire to talk to white or even Latino that, you know, persons or so on. Uh, they're afraid and uh, so alienated in their own sort of uh, uh, exploitation, exploitation, uh, etc. Um, that uh, for us, the strategy was to work with their kids. 
and uh, their kids start to do workshops on imagining what their neighborhood could be, and also to begin to create a new, what does it mean to create a new republic, and the kids started to write a new constitution for the neighborhood um, in different workshops. And then after the constitution, there were workshops of dressing uh, uh, for the future of that neighborhood, and so the kids started to have like this special, uh, what is it, uh, yeah, uh, customs, right, like the, the, this, this is one, which they, uh, Lucia, for example, was working on futuristic, all of this was inspired by Sonra and uh, our knowledge in Philadelphia of Afrofuturism. Sonra is a musician that started Afrofuturism in Philadelphia, and they had all kinds of works about thinking about a better future, better future. So once we had the kids involved in this, it was so easy to work with the parents, right? And then now the parents got in and then we started to develop a lot of, uh, of, of very interesting projects. Until today, I mean, these projects continue. Um, and uh, just to give you a sense of, uh, yeah, this is cultural center. And, and the relic name of all completely is totally messed up. Uh, uh, this was the development of the first flag so it was a collective, uh, a lot of the, the women there that were unemployed knew how to, how to weave. And so uh, they, they were commissioned the flag for the neighborhood, a new flag for the neighborhood. But it was not, as you can see, a flag for, that's it, yeah. Um, so that's the making of the flag. The flag ended up being this huge thing. Um, Thankfully, we have a lot of material. So, uh, if you are interested in this, there was a fucking little talent show. At least you can see parts of the flag here. Um, and uh, issues with children's investment, anti immigrant children's education. By the way, the, the principal of the school we work with got fired because uh, she was working with us. Um, and then we felt it was, it was absolutely horrific. I mean, like, she got fired, it put this totally right wing uh, uh, that, you know, it, it, things didn't go well with that one. I mean, like we managed to get the keys and the workshop finished, but then this, this principle was fired. Um, and uh, all right, any things? Yes. So, so I have a question. You mentioned so many projects of accreditation grantees. So which the so sought in uh, among these projects? What is my the, the so thoughts? So was the main, most important issue that yeah. we combine these projects into a, an integrated thought. Yeah, it's our struggle to figure out how could we have a radical urban practice in the conditions of the. It's uh, um, it's trying to find directions and ways which manage to create a bit of friction or. Uh, or push the limits of capitalists and their understanding of what urbanization cities and uh, living environments are. Uh, we that primarily are an anti-capitalist organization for, for our you know head. I mean that's I've said it already, it's in our main enemy is capitalism. And so uh, we're just trying to experiment with ways of organizing that differ from the main ideas of what capitalism would do. Put it that way. Uh, by this, I said I was going to talk about the contradictions. Clearly, there are a lot of contradictions. I mean, none of these projects have changed the world by any means, right? And, and, and that's the reason why we have decided to work at a different level after this, perhaps, Calgary project we're finishing out. But that would be the main thread, right, for our project. And again, it's, it's 10 years of like incredibly intense work. And one thing that I did not mention, which I think is very unfair, uh, that I should have mentioned, is that uh, the main premise of our organization was that we would not make money out of it. Okay. We we're actually structured as a non-profit organization, but in the Netherlands, which is very different than a non-profit here. And we said that if we really wanted a radical practice, we needed to have our a main source of income so that we could not depend on this project. Because what happens is if you depend on your activism to survive, obviously you will be compromised from the get -go. I mean, because you have to eat, right? We didn't want to do that, so we could afford the luxury of being fired by a landlord. Let's put that we didn't care. I mean, it actually was quite. I mean, we made it. You know, we made a landlord fire us. But um, but it's a luxury that we have. So in my case, 
uh, it was for the game was strategized as how would be academic would be my next sustain for Emiliano was curatorial practice for the GSDs and so on. So we all have uh, uh, basically what I said at the beginning as a parallel practice. That's what I think we all should be thinking of. I honestly believe that it's not possible to have alternative radical practice as a main source of income. And, and that is something that is not so much discussed because not all people have experimented on this, right? Um, the few friends that I have that have tried to do a radical sort of like more anti-capitalist directions, um, they end up either incredibly broke or, uh, or just compromising too much. Yeah. So that's something I have to mention. Right? I don't know if I answered it, but yeah. Yes? Um, you mentioned earlier that you think that housing is a key entry point in mm -hmm. terms of addressing yeah. um, the, the capitalism mm -hmm. in terms of, I guess, your position now in academia and, or maybe it's a potential project or mm -hmm. pie in the sky ideal project. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? What is a meaningful way that housing could be, could address that in your eyes? I think the, 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 the real, I have two main projects, and then both of them are incredibly important. To, um, to support the destruction of academia as a okay. I know myself I cannot do it, right? But I think it's absolutely insane that we continue to exacerbate on the disciplinary practices. I mean, like, the city is not produced by... It. I mean, I, the worst part is I've been in, in conferences where architects literally speak in front and say, like, we are the ones that know space. I mean, architects know shit about space, right? Um, and, and neither any other discipline. Is because we are not educated to collaborate, right? And we always feel that our knowledge is better than the others. And so, for example, when you talk about architects working multidisciplinarily, they hire others to consult on certain things, but they are like, you know, you guys that come up front, uh, without humbling to other forms of knowledge. And that is the same for anthropologists and sociologists and geographers. I've been in geography conferences where the same happens, right? Geographers feel like they are the masters and architects are just like, Actually, most people think that architects are the gang, right? Only architects think of themselves as, 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 as being very supreme beings. But, um, but, uh, but, but that's the same with all the disciplines. So um, I feel that there needs to be a way, uh, a big utopia of students, right? Demanding a radical, radical reconfiguration of what actually is relevant today. Because today's conditions are very different than in the modernist times where most of these curriculum and, uh, and a lot of the curriculums that are invented today, that, that we have today, uh, are at the complete service of the elites. You know? Architects, planners, they're, they're, they're people that are going to serve you know, you know, the, the Dubai magnets, the you know, Russian magnets, the American magnets, you know, and so forth, which it's against people. I mean, these, these, they're destroying our people. I mean, I don't have to tell you, but the situation of today is absolutely extreme. And, these apparatuses were charged supposed to produce the, the difference, the, 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 the other idea, are doing the opposite. They're just as conservative. I mean, it's also my university. I mean, I'm saying this university specifically, although it has a lot to do. But, um, but in general, and so if I don't see an uprise coming from below, of course, a professor like a professor like me, oh, you're too comfortable to say these things or whatever, etc. But that's been a struggle all my life. And it doesn't pick up. Because we all like to preserve our own safety nets, right? I mean, so uh, to get old people to, to oblige to this idea, it's basically to destroy your own career. And so who's going to do it? So the only people that could actually do that are the youngest generation. But it seems that the youngest generation just want to reproduce their own careers on the basis of the old ones, right? And there's no radical change that's totally needed. I mean, if you guys believe that, that, that today is fine, then by any means continue what we have now. So that's one of my main sort of like, I, I think uh, teaching is a political act, right? And uh, I do it because of that, not because of anything else. Um, I love, you know, knowledge, definitely, right? But it's a political act. But sometimes I think I'm depressed that a lot of the student body just wants to reproduce themselves into the image of what is destroying their own path, right? Because most of you will go out in the worst conditions that humanity has ever seen, right? In terms of moral humanity. No, in reality, in, in general, because the planet is about to collapse, you know, in terms of its environmental issues, right? I mean, you see all, all, all the issues that are happening, disparities, polarities, etc. And then, I haven't even discussed the artificial intelligence wave, right, that is coming, which you all know it's coming, but we don't want to understand that it's coming. 
right? Or the social media way, you know, that China right now has this app that is beginning to like in, in Black Mirror, not but to great people. That's the reality as we speak. And so there are so many things that what's happened, how are we in academic environments reacting to that? We just continue to say, oh, Ren Paul, that's, you know, he was the next whatever deal, right? Um, which was the same right, as the others, um, and don't do anything. So that's one hand. On the other hand, I really think that with that in mind, that will, in a few years, perhaps come up with a very different kind of urban practice, which is transdisciplinary in its nature, meaning that, that there's no single discipline that rules, right? And begins to look at the re re systemic reconfiguration of what exists. Right? And it's a slow process. As a Marxist, one learns that everything is a process. It's not like an instant revolution or anything like that. Um, and I would like, in my practice, to have a little bit of influence in that future scenario. Just tiny micro influence. Like, oh, there was a practice named quotation strategies at some point, you know, that did this kind of project, and they look at that. That's actually my main goal. Because I know that uh, alone I can do it. And sadly, my generation sucks, right? And so my generation is still very much embedded into the neoliberal ways. I mean, most of it, right? Uh, my, my, my sense is that the future is the old generation. So I mean, the, the generations that are really struggling, and they're going to struggle like crazy right, to do this. And so the dream project would be uh, to create a new disciplinary, a new practice, an anti-disciplinary new practice. Um, and uh, how to do this? Well, this is what you have to answer, right? Uh, but it's not a one thing, which is again what capitalism teaches you, right? It's like the superstars, what are they? They're individuals. They have teams of 500 people, but it's just like they invite that person to the lecture, right? Um, and so, uh, it's that mindset also, you know, that we're competing against each other. That means to, you know, we, we cannot do this by ourselves. It's impossible because we're just going to do it ourselves. But what I, uh, when I invite to give a lecture, I like to really create that consciousness. The, the world is in absolute mayhem. Right? I'm not sure if you understand what's happening around, but I think you do. You feel it. Every time I wake up psychologically, I'm not okay. Right? And, and it, every day is worse. I mean, and, and we know that even if Trump goes out or whatever, things are not going to change because it's not Trump per se. It's just this absolute systemic apparatus of inequality that we produce. And so, uh, yeah, that's why I position myself as an anti capitalist and so on. But thank, hopefully, there will be many like me and better and much better. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, yeah. And my, my current practice, I think that's part of the thing has been mostly to work with, and I don't, I've never said about this, but I've worked with many governments, uh, left-leaning governments, uh, in advising um, different left-leaning governments around the world, including Chavez at the time of Chavez, just to give you an idea of that. It was a crazy thing too. But um, I think part of the role of people like me that have already these kind of experiences, uh, and that I am tired and very consumed about with these type of projects, is to work together with different uh, organizations to support the construction of new imaginaries. That would be government, right? Or that would be more forms of organization. So my role right now is mostly in, in the, uh, we want to orient it into a, a large international consultancy agency for radical work. Right. Right. Any other questions? Yes. You mean financially? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think uh, we've been very lucky. We were very lucky. Uh, we never looked for one single project, which is crazy. Uh, the project kind of fell from the sky to us. I, I have to say, it's the reality. I mean, it was never like, oh, we don't have to work, we have to apply for this project, right? And that's the reason because we don't need the income from this. We were just like completely passive on this. And then we just got invitations of people that heard that or needed support for doing this. Um, and I still, I yes, despite having grants, right, and, and, but the grants came after the invitation, right? It's like this organization in Italy said, you know, let's put this thing together, and they actually helped lose most of the grant. Uh, the Philadelphia Project, it was the city of Philadelphia that invited us, and they helped lose this grant, right, and so forth. And so um, it, uh, it, it has never been like us searching for this. Um, I mention this because I really believe that the future of any urban practitioner should be dual. We have to eat. We have to eat. And we have to find a kind of practice that gives us to eat, 
that we feel the less ethically so, uh, compromised. But we will be ethical. I mean, I work for the new school, right? The, the, the Parsons has everyday luxury branding courses and, and inviting the CEO of Gucci and uh, the LVMH and Louis Vuitton and all these people, right? And uh, so, so, yes, the product design department works with Tag Hoyer to design fancy watches and so on. So, yes, that's my compromise. And I'm very aware of it, and I hate it, but I'm willing to be inside of that space. Um, and so, each of you, or the ones that want to follow or that is not content with it, should follow a path where you find something that gives you to it, but you dedicate half of your time or more to something else that you know that you might not get something to it. Again, the, the compromising by eating, by activism, this is one of the worst things that happened under the last year, even before, the professionalization of activism, right? Um, like, uh, activists can live out of being activists, and of course, uh, that kind of is contradictory to my point of view, right? Um, if you look at different revolutions, 60s, 70s, and so on, uh, activism was, was a commitment. It was not like, I want to live by being an activist. Like, you know, like so, yeah, the future is a parallel practice. Uh, and, uh, and, yeah, let's see. Yes? So my question is about, um, so I'm curious about the role of how you and your collaborators work in, across, you know, with uh, differences in cultural norms and representational modes and even epistemologies. Um, and I think, like, it's hard for me to narrow down this question, but where I'm coming from with this question is, like, I'm, I'm working with some people on a housing cooperative, um, and these people don't run in the same institutions that I've been through, and so I'm aware of the ways that, like, institute, like, being um, educated from particular institutions sort of, like, wires you into a type of discourse that isn't always available to other people, and so I'm wondering is what's the strategy that you or you know, you and your collaborators look towards in terms of um, both being able to bring some of that discourse um, into, uh, like, bring other people into that discourse, yes. uh, but also, like, being able to challenge some of the representation modes and, and uh, epistemologies that come yeah. from institutions that you I mean, the first thing you have to do is, is rely on other people for this. And, and again, it becomes very complicated because when you invite even friends, I mean, they, they want to get paid, you know? And that's, it's, it's, it's always like a huge problem, right? But uh, for us, uh, we've been uh, incredibly fortunate to have amazing people to support us with these type of things. And the most amazing crowd that we have worked with, uh, without doubt, has been uh, artists. Uh, uh, artists have an uncanny ability to sensibility to to artists, I mean, I mean that to, to, to help bring together things in a way that you normally wouldn't be able to see them coming through. And a lot of the projects that I show, uh, I emphasize the issue of play, of fun, of things that, you know, after all, we are humans and we need that, right? Uh, and uh, a lot of people have to in the past, I've been tried extremes on this, in this direction, that everything has to be about fun, or everything has to be about leisure. But we totally believe on that, too. So it's like, how can you make it less serious at the same time that it becomes super serious, right? Um, uh, we're all burnt out. I mean, we expect as a community organization, a community work community organizers, people that go to a meeting, a community meeting, they, the majority have had two jobs already, have left their kids at school at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., uh, especially the women who are working in Sunset Park right now, have cooked for their husbands because that's you know, what they're supposed to do. They clean the house, and then they have the energy to go at 8 p.m. on a Friday to be in a two, three hour meeting, right? I mean, like, this has to be a different kind of meeting, right? But uh, in most cases, they're not. I mean, if you go to a, a, a CD, a community board meeting, oh my God, it's to yourself, right? The worst, the worst. Um, so my advice would be just try to figure out how other people, right, that are more fun, a little bit more, or, you know, it could help to bring all these things, all these differences together. Yeah. I guess, like, if I can follow up, it's like, because I'm where I'm coming from, is that, like, I Having, like, for example, for me, having the Marxist framework to think about use value and exchange value is really useful, but I was only able to do that because I had the time to read it. Yes. And, 
And I don't always feel like it's, um, I'm always conflicted because I, I, I grew up in an environment where the library provided a kind of solace and an escape that was very important to me intellectually, but I recognize that not everybody else gets that. Sure, and but you don't try to. I mean, like, you kind of push these things to anyone. I mean, we're hopefully we're not Stalin or anything like that, right? Or Mao and in that form. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, like I, I teach, for example, like a course voluntarily on the paid at the People's Forum, which is this fantastic place. So it's, that on, I'm not sure. And uh, most of the people that I get in that course are uh, people that understand Marx and so forth, and I, I talk at that level, right? But when we're doing these communities, imagine talking with um, the, many of the, of the people that we work with or with the kids, of course, we're not going to talk about, you know, exchange value or use value or any other Marxist concept, but we're going to try to bring it forward with examples. And this is where the play comes, right? To make people aware of those things without making it heavy, right? And those of you, I assume the majority of those who don't have any Marxist training, I totally suggest you reach out for that, okay? Um, and, and, and forget about Stalin and Mao and Rocky Balboa against Russia, and that kind of thing is bullshit in terms of what Marxism is. Marxism is the most analytical way of understanding capitalism. And if you don't understand capitalism, you don't understand the city, because what produces the city is capitalism. And so you have to understand what capitalism is, right? And so, but that's you, and then you might be able to work around this. Right? Uh, but yes, with most of this community, we don't even bring it up. Uh, uh, why would most of them would not? Yeah. Right? yeah. Do you think that the, the, the Russian Revolution or the Revolution, very, very selective few read Marx, right? They were just totally pissed and fed up with the issues of inequality at the time. Right? With a temporary government that Russia had at that time and so forth. So anyway, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs>